the divine response. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. This sounds like a tale of modern times. Conditions at home were irksome. Its blessings and freedom imposed restraints. The boy was growing up. He wanted to live his life in his own way. He wanted freedom without restraint. He wanted to live away from home and still enjoy the blessing of the home. He wanted to be outside the kingdom and inside the kingdom at the same time. The sullen resentment and jealousy of his brother and the loving discipline and authority of his father annoyed him. Life beckoned. He could hear the call to the heights. Hills were green far away. They were wonderful and fascinating places beyond the narrow confines of home, illusory places, the primeval lie of liberty without law. Did the father try to restrain him? Did he attempt to keep him at home? Did he warn him of the error of his way, of the dangers ahead? No, he did not. Why? Because he was an individual and could not do it and could do as he pleased, and because home would not be a home to a boy of alien will. Now compare the attitude of the father toward his children with the attitude of human parents towards theirs. Except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die it bringeth forth much fruit. Emile Caddy in her book, How I Use Truth, says it, every soul must go down until he strikes his own level, his own self, before there can be any real growth. We may seem to hold another up for a while, but eventually he must walk alone. The time of his walking alone with his own indwelling Christ, his own true self, will depend largely upon our letting go of him. No one will seek anything higher than he is today, until he feels the need of something higher. Your dear ones must have the liberty to live out their own lives, and you must let them, or else you are the one who puts off the day of their salvation. But, says someone whose heart is aching over the arrow ways of a loved one, should you not help anyone? Should you not run after him and urge him continually to turn into the right way? Well, yes and no. I gladly, joyfully help anyone when he wants help. But I could not urge anyone to leave his own light and walk by my light. Nor would I, like an overfound mother, pick up another and try to carry him in my arms, continually treating him. A mother may, and sometimes does mentally, if not physically, through her false conception of love, carry her child until he is twenty-one years old, lest he, not knowing how to walk, fall and bump his nose a few times. But if she does this until he is a grown man, what will he do? He will turn and rend her, because she has stolen from him his inherent right to become a strong, self-reliant man. She has interposed herself between him and the power within him, which was waiting from his birth to be strength and sufficiency for him in all things. She should have placed him on his own feet, made him know that there was something within himself that could stand, encouraged and steadied him, and so helped him to be self-reliant and independent. Hundreds of anxious fathers and mothers, sisters and wives say, Ah, but I love this one, so I cannot stand still and see him rushing on to inevitable suffering. Yes, of course you love him, but I tell you that it takes an infinitely greater, more godlike love to stand still and see your child burn his hand a little, that he may gain self-knowledge, than it does to be a bond slave to him, ever on the alert to prevent the possibility of his learning through a little suffering. Are you equal to this larger love, to the love which does not hold itself on the QV to interpose its nagging bodily presence between the dear ones and their own indwelling Lord, who is with them always? Having come yourself to the mighty truth that God is all in all, have you taken the moral courage to be still no, to take off all restrictions and rules from others, and to let the God within them, each one, grow them as he will, and trusting him to do it the right way, keep yourself from all anxiety in the matter? It is written, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto him, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Will you invariably speak the word of remission or losing to your erring ones, or will you bind them closer, tighter, in the bondage which is breaking your own heart, by speaking the word of retention to them continually? If you really want your friends to be free, there is but one way for you. Loose them and let them go. For it is the promise of the Father through the Son, that whatsoever ye loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. That is one of the great lessons in our story. No one has the right to coerce another to accept his ideal. Every person has a right to keep his own ideal until he desires to change it. God is leading your friend by a way you do not and cannot know. It is a safe and sure way. It is the shortest and only way. It is the Christ way, the within way. What you say, is there nothing I can do when I see my husband, brother, friend going down? 
Yes, there is something you can do, and a very effectual something, too. The sword of the Spirit is the word. You can, whenever you think of your friend, speak the word of freedom to him. You can always and always loose him and let him go, not forgetting that the letting him go is as important as the loosing him. You can tell him mentally that Christ lives within him and makes him free. Tell him that he manifests the Holy One wherever he goes and at all times, for there is nothing else to manifest. And then you see to it that you do not recognize any other manifestation than good in him. He divided into them his living. That is another striking thing about the story. God's instant response to the son's request. When he asked for his share of the family fortune, God gave it to him. He did not argue. Why not? Because argument implies an opposite and God has no opposite. We argue to arrive at a correct conclusion. God already is the correct conclusion of all things. Therefore, he does not need to argue. The father did not argue with him, nor try to change his mind or restrain him in any way. He did not ask him what he was going to do with the money, whether he was going to buy a horse, an automobile, stocks, or bonds. He divided under them his living. The son asked for what he wanted, and the father gave it to him. There were no questions asked, no papers to fill out. There were no restrictions, no limitations, and no interest. The universe gives us what we ask. Experience alone will teach us what is best for us to have. As long as the younger son was in the father's house or God's consciousness, he could have had what he wanted by the simple process of taking it, using what was already there, and so it is with us. Material things will always come to us when we have the belief or mental equivalent of what we ask. God has something higher and greater for us than money, automobiles, houses, clothes, and land. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man, the things that he hath prepared for them that love him. What? Material possessions? Personal power? Bank accounts? Stocks and bonds? No, that love him, that love truth for truth's sake, that love God more than self. Jesus said, They that have forsaken houses or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold now in this time of houses and lands. Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. There are many lessons tucked away in this portion of the story, but probably none more important than the implied frustration which one reads so easily into the line. The younger son had come to the end of his rope. He was fed up. He had taken all he could, and he was now going to strike out for himself. He was going to do great things and without the help of anyone else. All he wanted was a grub stake, and he would change everything in his world. What a familiar ring this part of the story has. If things were just different where I am, if I could just get away from some place, if I could just get away from so-and-so or in such-and-such, such, then everything would be all right, etc., etc. Yes, it is the old belief that hills are greener far away, or what modern psychiatrists call just plain frustration. Either your problem is too big for you or you are too small for your problem. You have your castles in Spain, but others are standing in your way. You cannot be successful where you are because competition is too keen. Conditions always seem more favorable in some other place. Opportunities always seem greater. You have a big deal that would make you rich, but you do not have what it takes to put it over. Prosperity is always around the corner, but you never run into it. Why not? Because you do not have an integrated mind. You are trying to work from the circumference instead of from the center. You are working without power because you have not harnessed your power with God power. You have lost your centrality. You are trying to live your life on the low levels of conscious thinking, and you are diverting life instead of unifying it. You are scattering your good instead of attracting it. Maybe you should read again the summary of the law. The solution lies in organization, keeping your whole being, body, mind, and soul centered in God. When Jesus said, He that findeth his life shall lose it, but he that lose his life for my sake shall find it, he did not mean that we had to die in order to find God or heaven. He meant that we had to leave the consciousness of self and enter the consciousness of Christ. The clear command is, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Just as there are two periods in the measurement of time B.C. and A.D., before Christ and after Christ, so there are two periods in the life of every man, the government of self and the government of God. That is why Jesus told Nicodemus that he must be born again. But how can a man be born again when he is old? asked Nicodemus. Now listen to Jesus' reply. Except a man be born again of water, 
that is baptized, and of the spirit that is renewed in the spirit of his mind, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. To become God-centered and God-directed is not something difficult or hard to understand. It is simply a change of identity and a reversal of thought. Instead of keeping self at the center of consciousness as in the past, we now put God there and organize our life around him. Jesus said, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. In other words, do not accept or evaluate things as they appear, but look past the appearance to the reality back of them. The self-centered person lives in a house of mirrors. No matter where he looks, he never sees anything but himself. No matter where he goes, he always runs into himself. Now let us suppose that this same person suddenly discovers something within himself that is other than and greater than himself. And let us suppose that he begins to think and act as though this other self were his real or true self. What happens to the mirrors? They become windows through which he looks, not of himself, but beyond himself, to God and the good that is at hand. Someone has likened egocentricity or self-centeredness to an eternal infection located so deep in our system that no operation can be performed. The infection, to use a popular expression, has to be drawn out. Centering our attention in God and practicing his presence acts like a spiritual mustard plaster, drawing us out of ourselves and opening our whole being to God to such an extent that our diseased self will come to the surface and be healed by the warm rays of the divine sun. When Emerson said that self-consciousness is the fall of man, he meant that self-centeredness is the breeding place of all sickness, misery, trouble, sorrow, insecurity, fear, limitation, and defeat then what is the cure for such a deadly disease? The answer is, become God-centered, or as St. Paul said, put off the old man and put on the new man, which is Christ. The basic principle on which all spiritual promises are fulfilled, as Jesus pointed out, is absolute selflessness and obedience to the will of God. Thus, to become God-centered or selfless, one must forsake or lose the personal sense of life and embody the Christ or spiritual idea of life. In other words, he must remove the cause of all his troubles, the excessive concern with his own personality, before he can remove the trouble. And how does one do that? By thinking of God and others, and not only thinking about others, but by becoming interested in them and doing something for them. And when will the cure begin? When they have started doing something about what you have just read. But maybe you are one of those troubled souls who feels insecure in a fickle and dangerous world. You are worried about the future and what is going to happen to your possessions and to you. When you were young, your future seemed secure. Your parents or others provided for your education, insurance, and a comfortable future. Then, in a twinkling of an eye, the future became dark. You were thrown back upon your own resources, pretty much as was the prodigal son in the far country. Your material security vanished, and you found that you were bounded on four sides by yourself. What could you do? Where could you turn? But two ways seemed open to you, up or down. To the materially minded, such a debacle will seem most terrifying, a calamity, lives shattered because of it. To the spiritually minded, on the other hand, it will appear as a blessing, just as God would have it. The spiritually minded will see in the working out of the divine will, throwing people back on the infinite resource of supply and making them self-reliant. Instead of trusting in the false security of material things, they now will be compelled to find their security in God. Now is the accepted time, said Jesus. Now is the day of salvation. Perhaps that is one of the greatest lessons the world is to learn, that the only real future is in God and that there is no permanence in things. The only time spirit knows is the eternal now, and the only permanent riches are spiritual ideas. When we finally settle down to that, we shall discover, as Jesus said, that the only security here is to be found in the richness or possessions of the mind. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust do corrupt, or thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven or mind, which are eternal." Spiritual ideas which are only support come to us not because of an abundance of material possessions or the lack of them, but because of the receptivity we show toward God. When we possess that receptivity, we shall have a security that nothing in the world can take from us or even shake. Wilt thou be made whole? Will God forgive your sins, cure your ills, and supply your needs? Well, he certainly will. When? When you return home, become God-centered, and commit your will to His will and your mind to His mind. 
Only thus can you share again in the enduring satisfaction and abiding security of the Father's house.